It's about uh, time to enter into the core of the discussion um, <clears throat> uh, and our traditional discussion. And uh, I apologize uh, for the fact that uh, we have been a bit long so far, but all these uh, novelties and uh, uh, the, the tribute uh, to two uh, key persons uh, in the life of the DSOs in the past years had to be there. So um, thank you, Manuel, for your uh, participation uh, so far. Please uh, stay connected for the discussion as well. And uh, now I would like to uh, give the floor to Joao Torres, taking over the chairmanship of the council. No need to introduce Joao. He is an old friend. He has uh, covered uh, previously the chairmanship and vice chairman uh, position at uh, uh, EDSO. Uh, he is a, a thoroughbred uh, distributor, and uh, please, uh, Joao, the floor is yours uh, for your introductory words. Thank you, Roberto. Ladies and gentlemen, my friends. You're muted. I'm muted. No. You're muted, Joao. We can hear him fine. We can hear you. Yes, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Roberto, are you hearing me? Are you going? We hear you, Joe. <laughs> yes, okay. So, Roberto is with some problems in Milan, I'm sure. Yes, it was a problem. It was a problem in uh, in Milan with uh, the Wi-Fi system here that uh, splitted at a certain point. That happens. Yeah. Please, Joao, go ahead. Okay, thank you, my friend. So I'm saying just a good afternoon to all ladies and gentlemen and all my friends. It was a pleasure to be here for this to, this time to, to to follow the program. What a big day! And uh, I want to, to give you a warm welcome from Lisbon. And it's an enormous pleasure to welcome you today for the fourth edition of Stakeholders and Innovation Council. This year edition, my first edition as chairman, following my good friend Livio, could not even come at a better time. Still not in the best conditions, as was referred by Robert. As we will emerge from the pandemic, innovation will be key for the success of our digital and our green agenda. Well, uh, at this point, I want to salute Nikos and Ronnie. We have a long journey together, and we are very proud of our pioneers. And of course, a great abrazo to Manuel, another pioneer. Five years ago, you create, we created the SEEK to gather future-looking ideas and to deliver solutions that work for both, for our sector and for customers. Looking back, we, we demonstrated the innovative potential of DSOs. Today, also, we could not all sit in the same meeting room but I'm really proud of the collaboration Agility DSOs has shown during these unprecedented times, while most importantly, keeping our customers and their families top of mind. I'm glad SIC always prioritizes innovation. The Digital Power Awards just announced are a proof of it. And I want to give congratulations to the winners. Because it is only through innovation that you are going to get to the goal of net zero that was referred in during the past section. The SEOs are nearing at once in a generation peak for electricity investment, which provides both the opportunity and necessity to develop, test, and deploy leading edge grid monetization technologies. The past year has challenged us in many ways, but we have proven that even under the most difficult circumstances, DSOs will work diligently to ensure very best service, the access to inter uninterrupted 
electricity. Looking ahead, their source will continue to future-proof by preparing for an electrified future. Electrification is a safe bet in EU ambitions net zero, net zero by 2015 targets. And we are hard at work to ensure electricity is part of the solution. This year edition focused on a renewal and relies on three thematics. First one, future investments. Second one, regulatory framework and financial enablement. And last point, the last thematic, parameters and features of new SEO role. The far-reaching vision offered in this edition represents a new and more ambitious role for the SOs. It calls for new actions from government, regulators, and companies. It is an opportunity to continue delivering the three pillars of a strong system, reliability, affordability, and sustainability. The vision represents a real choice, a choice to pursue a proactive and coordinated approach to shaping our electricity future over a passive and fragmented approach. So to make successful big through innovation possible, what we need is a big through innovation in thing. And that, of course, is where the Innovation and Stakeholders Council comes in. I want to thank all the team that prepared this event and a special thanks to all the speakers kindly available to be with us. Mark and Philip will manage Idea Labs as a master duo. As usual, as usual, as always. To end, it's great to see so many of you here today from all those different backgrounds and perspectives, not just to celebrate what the EDSO Stakeholders Innovation Council achieved so far, an impressive thought in it, but also to prepare the ground for the future so that together, we can make impossible happen. Thank you. So uh, it is, uh, uh, I, I suppose that Mark uh, McGranagan and Philip Lewis uh, would have taken uh, the floor immediately. Um, so uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Joao, for, uh, for your words. And uh, um, the Ideas Labs is uh, the uh, module of this uh, Stakeholder and Innovation Council uh, that, that, that was conceived uh, to bring uh, on, on the screen uh, a couple of uh, hints uh, for discussion. Uh, please, uh, Mark uh, McGranagan, fellow EPRI, EPRI Europe, and Philip Lewis, founder and CEO of Vasa ETT and co-founder of the Traxis Group. You have the floor for your session. That's, that's great. Thanks, Roberto. And thanks, Joao, for the, the great introduction to this session. Um, as you said, I, the, Innovation is going to be absolutely critical as we go down this energy transition pathway. Um, Manuel Sanchez did a great job of highlighting some of the achievements in the last 15 years, but he also highlighted the fact that we have many more challenges ahead of us and, and uh, the importance of innovation in, in achieving those challenges. I think we have three very good topics um, to discuss our, I'm gonna go ahead and start my video. Thank you, Paolo. Philip's here as well. And uh, so we're happy to, to uh, kind of coordinate the discussions around these three topics. We'll, we'll st uh, start with a discussion of the 
investment requirements that that we see um, using the Deloitte study of connecting the dots as a as a starting point for that discussion. I think that's uh, going to be a moving target as we figure out what the investment requirements are in the future. Then we'll talk about the uh, regulatory and and financing issues in in uh, being able to make those investments and in, in facilitating those investments. And finally, we'll talk about the role of the customer, engaging the customer and what that means to the business models and, and uh, how those investments are going to be achieved. The way Philip and I will do this is uh, I will coordinate the, the first two topics in terms of introducing the speakers and I'll introduce the speakers for the first two topics. Philip will coordinate uh, questions that come and discussions that come uh, from the chat. And I encourage everyone, we have a great, as Joao mentioned, we have a great attendance here today of experts from DSOs uh, th throughout Europe, uh, and so members, as well as um, other members of the stakeholder council. So we encourage everyone to uh, participate we, with questions. And if we can call on you to ask those questions verbally, we'll do that. And Philip will, will gather those up so that I can make sure that we address those appropriately. And um, we'll try to pull together the important conclusions from these discussions at the end of these three sessions. So we have some time to talk about this. Philip, you want to add anything here in the, as we get started? No, I think that's good. Just to reiterate the questions, um, feel free, please, to ask questions and we'll try to add those in as we go along. So we want to challenge the speakers as much as we can. Great stuff. All right, let's get started with uh, uh, introducing the, the uh, topic of investment requirements as we go forward. And we have uh, three perspectives that we'll provide. We'll start with... Uh, we're going to start with Alberto. Is that right? Okay, good. Start with Alberto Amores um, with Deloitte to kind of give us an overview of the of the connecting the dots uh, study. Uh, all of the all of the, the distribution system operators, uh, you know, participated in this. We they evaluated investment requirements on a country by country basis, and uh, I think there were some very important conclusions there that should help us get started with the discussion. So Alberto, we'll give you the floor first. Hello, good afternoon to everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, EDSO to invite me to participate in this fantastic event. I am really pleased to be part of this panel with uh, this amazing set of experts and uh, top managers of the European distribution companies. I've been asked to resume, as Mark uh, has, um, uh, is saying, uh, in this first intervention, the study we did one year ago, jointly with Euroelectric, uh, and its main objective was to build the first of a kind power distribution investment outlook for uh, the next decade uh, from 2020 to 2030 for the 27 European countries plus uh, UK. Um, in the context of uh, going forward in this energy transition process. Um, the second objective of this study was to identify and propose the, I would say the long list of uh, policy and, and regulatory actions that has to be taken uh, promptly to allow this uh, investment plan and to make it real if we want to uh, really uh, move forward quickly uh, to the 2030 and 2050 objectives. But doing that, uh, we, what we did was uh, first, uh, as a first step to define jointly with the participants, the uh, European energy model and power system scenario for for the next decade. And we also identified, and a second step, the identify and define properly what are the main challenges that the DSO has to face during, during the uh, energy transition process. Um, so um, if we move to the next page, please. Um, and as I said, this is the first thing that we do. Uh, we did uh, to define the 2030 year scenario that we did absolutely aligned with the uh, European uh, Union decarbonization target for 2050. That means the uh, 
the emission neutrality in the second part of, uh, of the century. And we did, as Max said, country by country. And uh, the final result uh, was that the hydroelectric uh, scenario was at least as ambitious as the current national energy and climate uh, plans that every single member state has defined and approved uh, uh, during the last two years. And you can see on the screen the different uh, figures that characterize the, the scenario that we define. Uh, as you see, there is a lot of ambitions uh, in, in the on all these figures, uh, look at the uh, the numbers of, uh, for example, heat pumps, uh, 50 million, or so the number of IBs, or the uh, amount of electricity, industrial electricity that we uh, want to electrify uh, in 20 years, or so the uh, almost 500 gigawatts of uh, new uh, renewables and self-consumption capacity installed in the in the uh, during the next decade and. Uh, uh, most of, of, most of it uh, connected to the distribution grid and so on and so forth. Um, if we move to the next slide, please. And uh, as I said, we also define or identify the, the main challenges that the, the power grid uh, will face during this energy transition process in the next decade. And we are talking about challenges that are related with the investment planning and execution. This is a clear challenge in which the grid operator will have to anticipate and to optimize the investment that uh, should be done uh, in the different countries on the decades and uh, coordinating and, um, and make current that planning with not only with uh, 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 within the, the, the grid, uh, the, the distribution grid, but also coordinated with the TSOs and with the renewables uh, promoters and uh, also with the EV charging infrastructure has to be deployed around Europe. There's another big challenge related with the, uh, the east uh, to east, the investment execution, meaning that, uh, as you all probably know, this is a big challenge because there is a long duration of the permitting processes in many countries. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, these administrative processes um, really challenge uh, the, the, uh, the, to achieve the goals. Uh, because there is the delay in a lot of many of the of the uh, energy projects in some countries. There's also related to challenges uh, uh, related with the security uh, of supply and automation of the of the grid. We have to modernize the grid. Uh, when you look at the medium and low voltage uh, grid of most of all, at least several countries around Europe, you see a very old grid and. Based on our estimation, in 2030, more than almost 50% of the of the medium and low voltage grid will will have more than 40 years. That it's really old, and this is not the digital uh, network. And uh, at the, this uh, level of the of the of the grid, we need to uh, uh, digitalize that uh, that, that, grid, uh, that grid, and we have to automate the grid but, uh, very much. To enhance, that is another big challenge, to enhance the grid stability because of the penetration of green wave and uh, the intermittency. We need to increase the resiliency of the grid because of the effects of the, of the stream, um, um, of, of the natural disaster and stream, uh, stream weather events. And uh, we also uh, have to face a big challenge of enhance the data management, not only of the grid facilities, but also uh, the customers and uh, all the distributed resources and renewable plants that will be, we will have connected uh, in the grid uh, uh, every year. Um, and uh, and uh, um, for sure, a, a big challenge regarding cybersecurity. This is a big challenge for many things and also for the grids. And uh, for sure, we have big challenges related to integrate that variable generation to optimize the system operation routines uh, with the increasing levels of uh, variable renewable uh, to integrate the distributed uh, resources digitalization third parties to get that integration and to enable the demand side participation. So having all these challenges uh, in mind and having the, uh, the targets and the scenario that I described before, we did uh, uh, estimation of the investment uh, that the European grid, distribution grid will require for the next decade. So if we move to the next slide, please. 
We have estimated that we need more than 400 billion of new additional investment during the, the next decade in the 27 European countries plus UK. And uh, this huge amount of, of investment, we estimated that, uh, that should be divided in three main topics. Almost 50% of, of this amount will be dedicated to cope with the increase of the electricity demand, plus to connect the uh, EV in charging infrastructure, plus connecting the, the renewables to the, to the grid. Another almost 50%, a little bit less, uh, should be dedicated, as I said, to modernize and digitalize the, the network and to deploy almost for 100% of the customer point, uh, a new generation of, of smart meters. Uh, another 8% eight, eight, eight percent to the resilience uh, of, the, of the grid, mainly to uh, build underground lines in some countries. This is the main uh, amount of money dedicated to uh, resiliency based on our estimation. So if we may move to the next slide, slide please. Uh, this uh, huge amount of uh, uh, investment plan, uh, investment, uh, they are not only for the benefit of the DSO, they are clearly the benefits for the uh, uh, European economy and for the European society. And we try to, uh, uh, to uh, illustrate in, in this, uh, in this um, slide, because the investment in which will um, uh, uh, read uh, Benefit related with the competitiveness of the European economy because the renewable deployment and the electrification of the demand will reduce the generation cost of the uh, electricity system and will reduce the energy bill of the final customer. We also save uh, a lot of money uh, reducing the fuel Im imports. We are also, in terms of sustainability, uh, We'll have a, a big reduction, a big savings in CO2, uh, CO2 rights that the European economy uh, won't need to buy during the next decade. We are going to save money in terms of uh, health costs because of the reduction of pollution. We're going to reduce the energy consumption because electrification is efficiency. We also see a lot of economy uh, benefits for the European economy because uh, we have estimated that almost 90% of that investment plan will be, would be captured by uh, European manufacturers. That means also create a hundred of thousand of new quality jobs, et cetera. So um, we have also estimated what was the, uh, in, um, the, um, the increase of, uh, of that investment plan in case the European Union's, uh, Union uh, increased the, um, the environmental targets, that means mainly if the fifth or 55 package will be finally approved. And we have estimated that the, that the investment plan will need to, uh, to increase by 8%, uh, meaning 25 to 30 uh, billion euros uh, in, in addition, and mainly to connect new renewable plants. And um, finally, and this is my last slide, I think, um, we have uh, also identified the main the main uh, uh, regulatory and policy action that has, has to be taken at the European level, but also national level. I'm not going to get into the detail because there is another panel uh, afterwards that uh, they're going to discuss this in, in, in detail. But we are talking about mainly uh, to facilitate flexible and adaptive national planning frameworks to remove investment uh, li limited uh, li limits of investment that the DSO are allowed to do. Uh, to define the, the DSO uh, role in this uh, new energy transition process, uh, to change the remuneration models, to allow the investment in this new digital and smart grid that is very different from the past, and to uh, 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 allow the flexibility to be negotiated in the, in the market and to be make money with, with that flexibility by the customers and other agents, and finally, it's clear that we will need to, re to, to review uh, some of the electricity uh, tariff system that we see in the different European countries. So I stop here. I hope that I, I, I haven't spent more time than a schedule for this intervention. And happy to take a, a question afterwards if, if you wish. Um, Mark, we have uh, an Alberto. We just have two very quick questions just to clarify. Um, so one from Mayank Sharma. 
uh, which is, are the GHG emissions forecasts in line with Fit for 55 ambitions? I'll ask, and the second one, um, I can remind you afterwards, is um, looking at those uh, extra employees needed. Um, which sector do you think will be the most needed of those employees? Well, the, this is a, a very good question. Um, for sure, we see new employees, uh, new employment in, uh, in the uh, in the electricity sector, we we have an European uh, manufacturing uh, sector for uh, electricity equipment that is really strong and is very innovative, uh, very good products. So they export a lot to other parts of the of the globe. And for sure, you you will you um, uh, the DSO will need to purchase a lot of new products and very uh, modern ones in terms of. Uh, Substation transform digital transformers and, and a lot of devices to control and to mode the, 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 the network. We see a lot of work also in the renewable sector for sure. We need to, we have also again an European uh, industry that is very strong. But so you, we, we, we we will have to compete a lot with the ASEAN manufacturers for sure. But uh, but we have to do a lot of uh, renewable plants, uh, wind and solar. Um, when we are talking about electrification, we are talking about electrification of the demand in the uh, thermal uses of the of buildings and, and industry. Um, you can imagine the millions of buildings that has to be renovated and during the next decade. And this is a lot of uh, new jobs or in a very expert way for many kinds of jobs. Uh, and um, I would say in that part of the of the of the market that will need uh, a, a strong force forward, uh, like, you know, um, uh, that are um, working in that uh, renovation activities of, of buildings. And industry will need a lot of innovation also. And the first question was sorry. The the, the first question sorry. Uh, yeah, the first question was uh, are the GHG emissions forecasts in line with Fit for Fifty Five ambitions? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, with, uh, our study was was uh, calculated based on the previous ambitions. That means mainly to reduce um, forty percent uh, uh, the CO two emission compared to nineteen ninety. Um, but as I said, uh, we uh, as, um, although we did this study one year ago, we also uh, we in that in that moment we have also the news that the. European Commission wanted to increase the ambition to at least to 55% to uh, percent of reduction. And this is the, the number that I explained before that uh, mm -hmm. the investment plan should be increased in that case at least an 8%. Thank you. There's another question from Claire Duffy, but I'll, in the interest of time, I'll let, I'll let you answer that uh, through the chat. Okay, great. Mark. Thank you, Alberto. You're welcome. That's great. I have some questions as well, but I think what we'll do is we will go ahead and get a perspective uh, from the vice chair of EDSO, Johan Marnstam, and and uh, some questions may may come through from that discussion as well. So, Johan, um, why don't you give the uh, kind of the, the EDSO perspective on the uh, connecting the dots study? Okay, thank you very much, and uh, I will probably be quite brief if we can take the next. So thanks. Um, so I will make a presentation of a study that we have done together with uh, RWTH Aachen and Frontier Economics. And it's about the networks in investments and, and basically the balance between investing to make sure that there is really um, the network available when the demand is there versus to have, I would say, a moderate investment uh, program. And actually, I, I think I want to pick up to what uh, Alberto said on the, the forecast of the demand, because we can see actually, uh, and I think I'm kicking in open doors a bit, but we, we basically see all the forecasts that are coming in, that they are getting higher and higher because the electrification is really here. And as Kral uh, said before, electrification is a safe bet for the future. I would certainly subscribe to that. And as you know, we see um, a substantial increase in the demand. Um, many industries want to decarbonize their processes, electrify their processes. We see new industries like data centers and battery factories 
heat pumps um, to, to replace fossil alternatives in terms of heating and also more power generation that are greener, uh, more decentralized and, and more volatile. And on top of that, we are just in the beginning of the electrification of the transportation sector. Personal mobility, but also heavy transportation is something that we see coming um, in the future. So I would say all in all that uh, basically it will be uh, a great challenge for the DSOs, but also a great opportunity if it's managed in, in the right way. And I'm confident that that will happen, but it, there are some prerequisites for that. And uh, the study really shows uh, what happens if there is an undersizing of the investments, basically that the grid is not ready when the demand is there. I think we will see, uh, the study shows that there are some, I would say, direct costs. If, if you look at the re uh, renewables integration, uh, that there will be costs for the containment. Uh, we will also see uh, costs for um, basically not being able to charge mobility when that is required and also curtailment and, and the use of heat pumps that will be restricted. And then of course also the cost for um, supply interruptions. And I would say if you zoom out there is also a bigger perspective because there is also a cost for the society that uh, will not be able to do the industrial production, the transformation that is required. And that needs to then be balanced by the savings of doing the under investments. So that is what the whole study is all about. And, and basically uh, the key message here is that uh, the failure to invest and to make the grid ready when the demand is there, uh, the cost of that is substantially higher than the savings uh, you can have from, um, from holding back investments. And why is it so? Uh, I think it's interesting when you look at the risk profile. So if we change to the next slide, um, the fact is that actually the savings versus the cost of not having the grid ready uh, is asymmetric. So basically the, 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 the slide here shows basically this asymmetry that if you have an undersized um, uh, grid investment, basically when the grid is not ready, when the demand is there, the cost is, significantly higher uh, compared to the cost if you, um, if you have a slight oversizing of the grid, basically that the, the demand uh, will be met by adequate, um, uh, adequate grid investments. And I think this is a great challenge for the regulator because they, the regulatory system really opting for the optimal point. And I think in the past, it was probably a bit easier because we had a fairly flat demand increase, or uh, I, I would say a fairly predictable demand increase. But coming back to what I said in the beginning, that we are now seeing more and more forecasts um, uh, being higher and higher. I think the, the, the fact is that I'm sure that we all the forecasts are probably wrong and probably underestimated because the trend is so strong. So I think that will also be a very big difficulty and challenge for the regulation to really set the right point. And the study, as I said, shows this, that the asymmetric risk uh, makes, it, um, makes it quite, uh, I would say, attractive to ensure that the regulatory framework is there to make sure that the grid is ready when the demand is there. There is also another fact in this, and, and that is that if you, if you enter into a situation where the grid is undersized, uh, it, we, we, given the long lead times that we have in the investments with permitting processes, but also to ramp up the capabilities, um, the, it's, it's quite easy to stop investments, but it's very difficult and take longer time to start to increase and ramp up the investments. So the risk of under investing is significantly higher or the cost for under investing is significantly higher than um, over investing. And the fact is also that if you over invest in a growing demand environment, at the end of the day, uh, it might be a short term problem to over invest. So, and that is not really considered in the cost of, 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 of this in, in the studies. 
So to, to wrap it up, I, I think um, from an economic uh, perspective, um, if we change the slide, uh, I would say it's, 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 uh, it's from, at least from my perspective, fairly clear messages here uh, that it's really about making sure that the regulatory system creates the right balance. And again, I think given that we are now seeing a massive increase in demand compared to the past, I think that is a big challenge. It's really a new, new ball game from, for regulator, from a regulatory perspective. And here, I would say that the regulation or the regulatory system have a great responsibility to make sure that they set the right parameters to really balance this out. Um, as I said, um, it's very important to, to set the parameters in a way so the grid is ready when the demand is there. Um, so I think I would just stop there uh, with those clear messages. Thank you. That's great, Johan. I, I think uh, I'd like to go back to Claire Duffy's question, and it relates to a question that I had and it can be uh, posed to both Johan and Alberto, I think, and I think Alberto's in the process of answering Claire's question, but Claire, Claire's um, making a, an example of an Ireland. Claire, do you want to ask the question? Do you want to come on uh, unmute and ask the question regarding kind of the investment requirements and traditional investments versus how we can meet increased demand on the grid with flexibility and, and local local solutions that maybe would be considered non-traditional. Otherwise I'll ask it. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me now? Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, we can. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. Yeah, I was just curious. In Ireland, we we held a sort of industry or public consultation just looking for um information and evidence, I suppose, on a number of issues. And one was what potentially the forecasted split is going to be between maybe some of those more distrib um, conventional distribution reinforcement, particularly for to support electrification of heat and transport and, and the increased distribution renewables. And it sort of started to come out around the sort of 70, 75% where maybe the more conventional and 20 to 25% maybe of solutions for distribution reinforcement would maybe be coming from flex service. So I was just very interested to see if there were any other observations from other studies um, that would help inform us on that because it's a tricky one. Great to respond uh, right in, in the Q&A chat, but uh, if you want to me to respond uh, to that uh, question. Yeah, yeah, Alberto, if you can yeah. give a perspective on that, I think it would be useful. And I, I the, the my angle on that also was, in, in listening to Johan's uh, presentation, was as we invest in the digitalization, which is a very significant part of the, you know, the estimated investment over the next 10 years, you know, the objective of that is to, one of the objectives is to enable this local flexibility and enable uh, more optimized use of the investments that we have to make in the traditional grid and <clears throat> whether, you know, how that's taken into account in the study and is it, you know, looking at Johan's data in terms of the risk of overinvesting being relatively low, you know, how much do we rely on that local flexibility to to you know handle part of that that demand and, and investment requirement? Yeah, um, I fully agree. And to, to add to this uh, to that answer, um, I, I would say that this uh, this uh, distribution this percentage are um, are really different depending on the country you look at. This country in, in which electrification and uh, this process of digitalization and modernization of the grid is well advanced, and while others are not so advanced. And, uh, and when you are looking at to this, that second uh, kind of countries, the investment that they have to do in the conventional network is uh, is higher than the other ones. Um, and also, uh, it affects the that distribution between. Uh, conventional versus non-conventional investment, how uh, the DSO or the regulators uh, define or consider the investment on modernization versus digitalization of the network. I mean, in many, and, and this is not a very easy thing to separate. 
because most of the more uh, modern devices are, are already digital. Um, but I, in in other but in, uh, um, or a big part of them of the of the facilities at the end, you will have to shift to the, the you know a line that is maybe 40, uh, 50 years old for the new one, uh, and this is modernization. And for example, when you look at the a substation or a digital transformer, it's not so easy to to uh, define. This is a a, a a a new conventional device versus a digital one. Yeah, the study I presented didn't really differentiate between um, uh, digital or, or smart investments, flex services versus the conventional uh, investments. But but the personal reflection would be, and I fully subscribe to the fact that it differs between the market significantly, also on the generation mix and the, and the customer mix, what, what kind of type of consumption you will have. Uh, but I think also over time, we will probably see a significant increase of the um, the non-conventional solutions also uh, based on the fact that we will see more and more solutions developed that will be integrated into the energy system. That's great. I appreciate that. That's a, a good discussion. We're going to take a, a little uh, a little bit of a segue from the from our uh, scheduled agenda. If it's okay with you, Eva, was going to go next, but we're going to have uh, Guido, Guido Bartoni go ahead and give us a few words about uh, the DSO role as we look at these investment requirements and, and regulatory requirements. He has to leave at that halfway past the hour, and uh, we'd like to make sure we get his input in this discussion. So. Guido, I'm going to turn it over to you. I think we've had a good discussion already, and maybe you can reflect on that and, and give us your perspective at, at Ch Chasey. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. And then sorry to jump into this, uh, this present session being scheduled for the, for the third one. Um, but I have some urgent businesses and then I have to anticipate. So sorry for that. I have prepared a couple of slides to pass on my, let's say, sole message. The only message I have on the role of the DSO to foster the changing and challenging role of the future DSO. Uh, I'd like to scale up uh, the, the message from Manuel Sanchez because this, uh, his message was the main conclusion we got uh, thanks to a lot of discussion, many discussions uh, run uh, within the European Commission stakeholders group on flexibility markets, of course, and the DSO uh, role. I don't know if you see, um, if you see uh, my slide. Not yet. It says you're starting screen sharing, at least on mine, but it's okay. not there yet. Maybe now. Anyway, one, just one, one second. Not at all, I think. But anyway, I just, uh, let's say, pass over the, the message. I think we have this uh, to discuss, this evolving role of the DSO. But I need, I think, uh, if you like, to change the role of the DSO, to develop the role of the DSO or the, or the DSO for the future, uh, we have to, let's say, to evolve the regulatory framework either in order to foster, as I said, uh, this changing role of the DSO. Of course, uh, we need for, uh, let's say, flexibility, more flexibility in decarbonized power system and the new paradigm for flexibility based on non-conventional, the so-called unwired, 
resources as an alternative with respect to wired resources, which is which are the historical one. Of course, these alternatives can be applied uh, subject to certain limits, but I think, uh, let's say, most of the new flexibility resources are available or potentially available at medium voltage and low voltage levels. Uh, this availability, new, uh, as I said, new flexibility resources makes flat the historical shoot between TSO on one side and customer and its customer on the other side by creating a platform, a new platform to provide services to the, new, to the network from wires and from customers. So the evolving role of the DSOs for sure is more and more towards a system operator at medium voltage and low voltage levels. Of course, DSOs still manage the wire resources, which are in some cases essential for reliability also in providing, in providing some exclusive service. So for some services, you have to, let's say, to, to, to cope with uh, new wired sources from resources from the DSO. But uh, in some cases, there should be an emerging competition against other flexibility unwired services. When accessing flexibility services, system operators in distribution at the distribution level take an asymmetrical role, being at the same time possible providers of the services, let's say wired services, and possible buyers of the service in other cases, let's say the unwired uh, services. Uh, in order to follow the, the very well-known uh, principle, make it or buy it. So we have this, as I said, asymmetrical role in our, uh, in our uh, system, in our new role of the DSO. And then we have to, let's say, be sure that the, uh, this changing role could, be, could deserve this, uh, this uh, let's say, the new, the new, the new uh, era of the flexibility market. Of course, the main driver, the triggering driver, I think, to change the role of the distribution system operator is, of course, the regulation. I think the, regulate, the regulation has to or shall innovate, shall evolve in, 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 other, in other terms uh, in order to uh, adopt flexible schemes, let's say, the current schemes in, in terms of capex-based regulation should evolve in order to eliminate the possible conflict of interest, as I said, between uh, these two principles, make it or buy it in, uh, let's say, using flexibility services in this, uh, uh, in this, in this, uh, in this respect. So there are some uh, I think uh, uh, prominent examples for some European regulators uh, uh, in which they are uh, experimenting or let's say some piloting, um, doing some piloting in order to see the regu their regulation to evolve in order to put uh, the DSO uh, in, 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 a, in a good position to make a real choice between they make it or buy it. Uh, of course, for the sake of development of the uh, flexibility market, as well as the customer involvement in this, uh, in this respect. So I think uh, uh, I, I should, uh, let's say, I wish, of course, that this uh, uh, development, both at the DSO level that I see from today, they are quite ready to uh, undertake this uh, challenge and then to uh, exploit uh, a lot of flexibility service in managing their uh, system, their, their grid and their system as well. Uh, but of course, I, I underline the fact that also uh, regulators could, let's say, uh, could, could, could have or could introduce 
a very big jump uh, in order to uh, facilitate, in order to foster this evolution. And of course, my best wishes that this cooperation between the DSOs as well as a regulator would, uh, let's say, uh, come out with uh, effective result in the near future. And um, <clears throat> I also wish the, the, the good, uh, let's say, continuation of this uh, work in this extraordinary uh, event. And uh, please, uh, sorry again for my, let's say, uh, interruption and in this uh, intervention, but I have to leave now. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Guido. Yeah, thanks, Guido. That was, I think that's going to set the stage nicely for our discussion in uh, the second part here when we get into really talking about the regulatory innovations and uh, and requirements. And but before we do that, so we'll keep that in mind. Appreciate those comments. And uh, we'll, we'll go kind of fi finish up our discussion of the investment requirements with uh, Eva Mancera, who is the CEO of IDE, part of Iberdrola. Uh, Eva, want to kind of give your perspective from a customer services point of view? Do we have Eva? She was around before. We can come. We can come back to Eva. Would you say, Philip? That's a go ahead on to, especially since we just heard from yeah, Guido yeah. and bringing up yeah, the regulatory so issues. Do we? Is yeah. I don't think we can. Yeah. Eva, can you hear us? I think not. Yeah, I think we. if we move on for now, then, yeah, if we move on to, to Clara. Yeah, I think it's a good time right after Guido kind of bringing just, up- Just while we're waiting for that, just one quick question from the audience, I think, is um, we've been discussing, of course, about um, um, the, the importance of um, um, heat storage. As, a, as an option for flexibility. How much, how much there's a question from Massimo uh, Marazzitti uh, from DGN about um, is heat storage considered as an instrument to optimize flexibility? And I guess we could ask that to any of the, any of the previous speakers. Maybe I, I start and, and first I would like to yes, yes comment on, I mean, an addition to, to, to my presentation, because I, I think uh, I was inspired by the previous speaker as well, that um, of course it's not now just to throw the ball over to, to the regulator, because I think really, uh, and, and that is also a key in the energy transition that we need to collaborate uh, between regulators, politicians, and, and the DSOs, and also with the customers, of course. Uh, so I just wanted to make that statement. When it comes to heating flexibility, I think that from my perspective, we shouldn't exclude any possibility to attract flexibility that can help us to optimize the grid and to increase the utilization factor of the grid. Uh, and, and there, I, I think I put only a question mark about uh, uh, the cost um, for converting uh, the heat storage into then electricity. So I think it makes a lot of sense, but I put a bit of a question mark at least today on, on the cost side. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's appropriate. And I, I think uh, it's clear that the co comments that we had about that, that the, you know, really distribution companies are going to be real, have to be real distribution system operators. And we will need to get flexibility from all levels of the grid to integrate more renewables, regardless whether they're distributed renewables or offshore wind farms or large solar installations. That the the uh, flexibility requirements uh, for those systems for managing the demand from electric transportation is going to have to come from all levels. So I think that that plays to the to the 
conclusions in the Deloitte study showing that that some significant part of that $400 billion investment requirement will be enabling that flexibility to be provided, whether it's the solution for local grid investments. You know, I think that Peak Low Flex winning, winning the uh, award in, in the local market category was very, very appropriate and, and shows that we, I mean, we will have the platforms that can, can allow um, flexibility to, to be acquired from, from local resources and you know, making that part of our, part of our solution. So that's a good, uh, I think that's a good segue to, to start to talk about some of the regulatory challenges and innovations that may uh, enable these investments to be made by the appropriate parties and, and the digitalization of the distribution system to make, a, make it a real distribution system operator configuration. Um, is, is a very important topic. And Clara Paletti has been talking about this at, for a, a number of our conferences and, and discussions, and I'm always delighted to hear her perspective. So Clara, why don't you uh, get us started on that topic? Thank you, Mark. Thank you for inviting me to this very interesting meeting. I really enjoyed the previous presentations, very interesting. Uh, and um, from regulatory perspective. Let me start by saying that at distribution level, we don't have a harmonized uh, regulatory framework. So it's difficult to talk about regulation of distribution uh, uh, from a European perspective when we go into details. But uh, in general, I would say that uh, the current regulatory framework is a framework that was designed under a steady state uh, kind of situation and scenario. So a more static regulation where uh, the need was more to better use the existing infrastructure, infrastructure and uh, uh, reduce uh, cost, so improve efficiency. Mm, uh, in this type of framework, uh, uh, you know, we had, we still have, I think, more or less uh, a revenue cap type of regulation or a price cap. So a standard, uh, pretty standard incentive mechanism uh, uh, coupled with some uh, more performance based type of uh, mechanism, for example, meant to improve uh, quality of service. Uh, if this is the case, I think that uh, looking at the uh, DSO regulation, uh, uh, asking whether more or less uh, investment um, can uh, bring, uh, um, you know, can, can have a, a high, a higher impact on uh, the the overall welfare. I don't think is the is the right approach because this is the is this not the way our current um, framework works. The, the framework uh, is designed under a weighted average cost of capital, so trying to design tariffs and allowed costs that would sort of create a framework where DSOs are able to collect the right amount of money to make investments. Uh, and, and so we don't have a real planning at distribution level in many countries today. And that's uh, an issue maybe that we can pick up later. Uh, so the, the incentive is more, as I said before, uh, focused on uh, effi economic efficiency. And this is why uh, when asking ourselves if, is, if the current regulatory framework is generally fit for purpose uh, uh, to support the energy transition, I would say that we need to change. We need to adapt it and we need to move to a more forward looking agile type of regulation. Uh, it is no longer sufficient to focus on uh, the efficient use of existing infrastructure and replacement and reinforcement investment. We need to develop. So we need to put a lot of money on the table and we need to decide uh, uh, how uh, uh, the, the money should be used. And first of all, the first step I see in that direction is remove, removing the CapEx bias. 
and and this is something that um, uh, would uh, of course in uh, uh, at least reduce the bias between uh, uh, the what you call conventional investment and non-conventional investments. And let me add here that as a regulator, I still have to be aware that I don't know everything. I want to make sure that the DSO uh, uh, moves in the right direction, but I, I cannot pretend to manage, micromanage their investment. I think that's my view, personal view. And I should encourage the use of flexibility services. This is something that has already been mentioned. And finally, I should encourage the optimal use of existing infrastructure. So make sure that we don't develop new infrastructures if they are not needed. So optimize the use of the existing infrastructure requires probably adapting or thinking over the current tariff structure uh, and uh, um, the price signals that are um, given uh, to the users of the grid. So that's the first, my first uh, uh, point that I, uh, I wanted to make. Uh, of course, moving away from the steady state regulation is easier said than done. Uh, just by the way of example, how should we measure the performance? Uh, how do we allocate the risks? And this is something that was mentioned before as well. For a, an efficient risk management, we need credible policy objectives. Those are necessary for GSOs to credibly and properly plan their own investments and their own activities and management. Uh, and this is also necessary for financial sustainability of the energy transition. We are in a sector that is highly capital intensive and we need to keep the cost of capital uh, low, as low as possible. Of course, we have a trade-off here between uh, uh, this certainty and uh, giving the right incentives to TSOs under an uncertain scenario. So it's not easy again. Uh, we face a trade-off as regulators between uh, standardization, liquidity of our markets, the liquidity of our solutions, and uh, flexibility. That's another uh, tricky part. And we need a level playing field uh, uh, for consumers. So this is the, the first big uh, chapter we need to address. The second one is innovation, I think. Uh, regulation needs to better consider disruptive innovation and infrastructure transformation. We already have incentives to improve and innovate our systems, but we really need to uh, properly uh, define frameworks to support specific projects uh, and, and even to find the common language because we talk about sandboxes, uh, pilot projects, regulatory experiments, and we don't have, I think, a common framework when we, we discuss that. So it would be useful to work on uh, uh, at least a common understanding of what are we moving away from an input-based type of regulation. Sometimes maybe it's still useful to stay on an input-based incentive mechanism. For example, this is something that has been done for smart grids projects in many countries. Or do we want to move to a more performance-based incentive mechanism? This is probably the future, but we need to go step by step because this is, this is not easy. We need to identify and measure performance. And sometimes regulatory uh, experiments are good as well and necessary test specific regulatory provisions or market arrangements in the field. And overall, we have to make sure that these temporary solutions are temporary. So give uh, just a, a, a timeline, make sure that the results become known to everybody. There is transparency. We learn from the experience on the field and then we move forward. The third uh, uh, element I, I, that I would like to bring to the table is sector integration. I know this is a label and sometimes becomes an empty label, but really I think the evolution of our energy sector calls for a better, better uh, sector integration. 
left aside the coordination between electricity distribution and transmission, which is clear, is something that we need but we need to better integrate uh, our uh, solutions uh, for the transitions cross sector as well, at least in terms of uh, uh, discussion and uh, uh, sharing of best practices. And, and when uh, discussing about uh, the new uh, challenges and the new uh, metrics, uh, uh, Again, there is something that has already been mentioned, but I think resiliency is a very interesting example of how our view on the functioning of our system has to adapt. We need to integrate resiliency in our regulatory framework, identifying targeted regulatory tools. So that's all on my side. Thank you, Mark. That's great, Clara. I don't know if we have any any questions from I don't think we have any from from the group, but I really appreciate you bringing up the, the topic of resiliency. I think it's a good example of of some new priorities, maybe even climate change adaptation um, related to resiliency, maybe an important consideration. Another one is uh, that seems to be very important in the states. And I think it is here as well is energy equity. And, and how the investments uh, help accomplish that. And I think those are examples that, that uh, point to, to your discussion of performance metrics. You know, if we, like you said, we probably are headed to performance-based regulations over time. We see it in Hawaii, we've seen it in the UK headed in that direction, but it, you know, it, it means that we have some work ahead of us to define what performance metrics can be used for evaluating progress, you know, and, and if it's going to be the basis of, of compensation. So does that make sense to you? And, and that we're kind of going there, but we have a lot of work to do to get there. Yeah, sure. Uh, you're right. And, uh, but the forward looking approach as well is important because the way we define uh, um, recognized allowed revenues now is by looking at past cost. And, and that's not, that, it, that cannot work for the future. We have to improve. Uh, and it's, it's very difficult, you know, how much should I uh, recognize in order to move into the right direction? Uh, and, and there is where I, I, for sure, I need to keep this Tortex uh, uh, approach where I don't target capacity, uh, I don't target investments per se, but I target the service, what is needed for the system. Because otherwise uh, I will never get there because I don't give the DSOs the, the necessary incentives to move in the right direction and to provide the, uh, the needed innovations. Uh, Clara, there is, uh, Mark, there is just one question that is sort of related, and I'll expand on it, uh, from Guillaume or uh, Sabatier. It's about um, training that's needed for this transition, um, but also, I guess, just to build on that question, which is that um, uh, it's a, a great presentation, by the way, Clara, and, and great ideas and great, great um, suggestions. I think the, the question that I would have and relates to Guillermo's question is that um, now there's a uh, there's a, a lot of build up time for a lot of these new solutions, these innovative solutions, these new approaches that we're going to test out and try out. How much time or how do you limit the time that's taken? Because whichever ones we choose going forwards, if we have pilots first and other solutions, there will be a, a very long lead up time to getting them scaled up. How, um, how much time do you give these sandboxes and trials and pilots before you kind of decide which ones to go full on with? That's a very interesting question. In my experience, that depends on the type of uh, project you have. It's much more easy to test a technical solution because there you have experts, you ask them and they give you uh, an idea and you can sort of uh, be generous a bit and then and so define the time limit. Uh, it's much more difficult to test a regulatory setup because sometimes the system simply moves slowly and operators are slow, but even stakeholders, uh, investors. So everything is, is more slow than 
you might think. Even consumers, they don't move, they don't react. So it takes time. And so the, uh, the experiment usually lasts longer than you would think. Thank you, Mark. Great. Why don't we, I kind of actually like this going back and forth between uh, the DSO perspectives and other perspectives uh, from Chasey and from Clara. So Eva's back and uh, why don't we go go back and get the, the Iberdrola, the IDE perspective on investment requirements and uh, you might have uh, some thoughts based on Clara's comments as well. And in, uh, in your thoughts, Eva? Yes, of course. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in the fourth stakeholder innovation council of IPSO. It's a great pleasure to participate in this panel dedicated to the very timely issue of investment in the electricity sector. The Deloitte study that has, uh, that has just been presented by Alberta Morris is very clear. Despite the focus being usually on the development of renewable generation, the energy transition needs an important increase in investment in electricity distribution grids. Just last week, Commissioner Simpson stated clearly in the European Infrastructure Forum that grid investment must grow significantly from now to 2030. We, we not only need a more robust grid, uh, we also need smarter grids that will fulfill the role of the DSO in which distribution companies become platforms that facilitates more renewable integration and empower customers to allow them to benefit from their flexibility services. Without a stronger, more digital and more resilient distribution networks, it will not be possible to reach the electrification and decarbonization targets drafted by the European Commission in their recent Fit for 55 proposals. Furthermore, these great investments must be materialized ahead of need to prevent bottlenecks that would bring frustration and may even derail the public acceptance of electrification. This is a risk that uh, we must not neglect. One fact that must not be overlooked is that investing in the electricity grid is an optimal lever to help the world economy recover from the current crisis brought by the pandemic. Uh, a May 2020 Oxford Smith School paper written, uh, among others, by Nicholas Ster and Joseph Stiglitz, uh, identified the investment in clean energy infrastructure as one of the best options to deliver a positive climate impact, as well as a significant boost to GDP and employment. Uh, but in, in order to achieve these objectives, we need to urgently solve several regulatory problems. First, uh, we need sound investment frameworks. We need more stability and predictability of the business environment in which we operate. Uh, as a sample of uh, defective regulation is Spain, in which the regulator is forcing ex investment caps to grid companies linked to GDP. These measures were taken a, a decade ago uh, in an environment of financial difficulties, but today they are totally incompatible with the ambitious electrification and decarbonization challenge that the government uh, itself has split in its national energy and climate plan. Secondly, we need to build a solid regulatory foundation to develop the full role of DSO. The distribution, <laughs> sorry, the distribution companies of today are clearly the most suitable entities to develop the role of distribution system operators. There is no need to introduce new entities by the name of independent great man managers that at the end of the day will only introduce bureaucracy and administrative complexities. Uh, regulators uh, uh, so, should also help us uh, unlock the full value of smart meters. 
when distribution companies are given the responsibility of developing a smart metering system, their results often exceed expectation and plenty of value is created for customers. Take, for example, Spain. Uh, once again, the assignment of the whole smart meter project to distribution companies has rendered a system that is already fully developed affordable with a state of the art application for customers access uh, and with an impressive improvement in quality of supply we are very proud of these uh, successful results that set the reference for others to follow uh, when entrusted dso's have demonstrated the capability of developing and, man and managing complex digital environments including the adoption of higher standards of cybersecurity and data protection. A future cybersecurity regulation must be carefully balanced, avoiding unnecessary management costs and complex administrative processes. Uh, in this journey of the energy transition, there is a lot of work ahead for regulators, for DSOs, for equipment vendors and for all other stakeholders in the industry. But let me emphasize that this huge effort will pay off. Uh, first, with a fully electrified economy that relies mostly of lo on local renewables, uh, we will be protected from gas and oil shocks like the one we are currently suffering. Uh, and finally, and these are the best news, the electrified energy future will be more affordable for families and industries. As a recent Goldman Sachs study shows, embracing net zero policies for 2050 will render a 50% reduction in energy bills for households when the cost of heating, gasoline and electricity are all accounted uh, for. Uh, thank you for your attention and thank you, Joao, for your leadership and dedication to this successful and fruitful stakeholder and innovation council. Thank you. Thanks, Eva. Very consistent uh, points to what we've been hearing um, from the Deloitte study itself and, and from the other uh, DSO perspectives. Let me uh, go ahead and ask one question that, and this can be um, other other DSOs. I, I, I was really impressed with the uh, Digital Power Award for eReadies on their low voltage monitoring um, activities. And uh, I was part of the advisory group for the upgrade project that Iberdrola did a number of years ago. And I know here in Ireland that a, a major focus of um, investments in digitalization is on low voltage monitoring and awareness and visualization. I'm wondering how, how much of that projected costs between now and 2030 for digitalization involves extending our awareness down to the low voltage system and all the way to the customer for you know, the communication infrastructure required for that, the monitoring and, and all of the systems to support that. Is that the biggest chunk of the investment that's required for digitalization is kind of the 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 last frontier, the low voltage system. Well, I I'm, I'm not sure. I think that digital investment and traditional investment, as as the, is mentioned before, uh, do not compete one with another. Uh, I think that. They are complementary, they are not substitutes. One cannot deliver electric, electric power by, via internet or Wi Fi. So we must all understand that traditional grid performance are, will be needed to be able to deliver the peak power that customers need, the resiliency that we will need with more and more strain, uh, uh, atmospheric uh, or weather events. Uh, and the digital investment reinforce the, uh, those investments to maximize this uh, output. So I, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know if Alberto have more data to, to share with us, but uh, of course, I, I think that digital, digitalization in Spain was, uh, has been, or, or smart meters in Spain 
has been a, a big successful uh, both for customers uh, and for us. Yeah, and smart meters is definitely part of that investment, but it's you know monitoring at the transformer level and automation at the transformer level is is part of it also. And I, I think the criticality as we electrify transportation and people have home charging and we electrify heat, you know, is it's, it's a critical time to you know if we're going to optimize our existing infrastructure, that that's obviously needs to be part of it. I was just wondering how much of it. The DSOs are are thinking it's you know where, where in terms of percentages how much of it is the, the kind of extending to the low voltage system we could leave that out there and might be something that we uh, we comment on as we go forward in terms of one of the priorities. Any other questions that we need to address there, Philip? For no, I think that's I think we can go go forward. One? Yeah, I think what what we can do is uh, go on to wrap up the, the first two parts with Linda Zilina um, from International Sustainable Finance Center and just give us a perspective on what the challenges are in obtaining financing for all of this investment that's required. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for uh, having me here today. Um, I mean, we all are very, very aware of all the great financing needs that Europe has. Um, I think there's quite some shocking numbers in terms of what the investment gap is. However, um, so I'm the CEO of ISFC, which stands for that very long name. Um, and what we do is we focus predominantly on the financial sector, um, having a background of around 15 years uh, working with financial sector. Um, I thought it might be useful to maybe have a quick look as to what is happening within different uh, market participants, different investors, banks, so on and so forth, these critical nodes of the system that we need to finance the needs that we have. So if we go to the next slide, please. So we are all meeting in a post COP26 world, which is of course, uh, as you might have heard, we achieved a bit, but not enough, so on and so forth. But one big change was that the financial industry was there in force. And it also had uh, very, very many business people there, which is a novelty. If you think about Paris COP, you had many more experts and people working uh, in practice on some of these issues and challenges. Now what we had is a lot of posturing and a lot of pledges and a lot of PR. But guess what? There's also a bit of change in terms of the regulatory landscape and in terms of the asset owner pressures on asset managers. So what we have currently, is the big realization that energy is absolutely key to everything. We have spoken to big business across Europe. A lot of them are worried about their supply chains because guess what? Some of their supply chains still use electricity from, um, from coal. Think about Poland, think about Czech Republic, think about Romania, so on and so forth. These are big growth economies, big impact. But, um, but they get really bad ESG ratings because some of these businesses might have the best R&D, best technological processes in place, but because of their energy use and the way they have to report, they don't look very good. So everybody wants to work on energy. Energy is very popular, which is a great news for, for DSOs, because you can actually start influencing the conversation a bit more, which is why I think these initiatives of getting people together and uh, doing things jointly is a great idea. So. One of the greatest challenges that we face, and you're gonna hear this time and again, everybody talks about public-private partnerships. Everybody has come to the realization that public funding is not enough. Well, we knew that, we've known that for a long, long time. And we also know that we need to mobilize private finance, but we are very bad at doing that. And that has a variety of different um, reasons. One of the main reasons is how do you figure out how, the, how to make the consumer happy so that the, ele uh, that the elected government can be re-elected versus investors actually making enough money. And this is where we think there might be some change coming. Of course, it's all about money, uh, but there's also additional factors that are growing in importance. So if we go to the next slide, and I haven't prepared many, so don't worry, um, this one's a little bit text heavy. So 
what we have is a big change in terms of investment and financial landscape. Because of quantitative easing in Europe, we have huge amounts of liquidity and a lot of investors looking as to where to put money. This has actually led to very interesting uh, explosion in venture capital. Private equity also has a lot more money than it has been. Or than it used to have, and institutional investors, which we call the big tankers because they have a lot of money and they're very slow in terms of adapting new approaches, even those ones are facing new pressures. And these pressures arise from the fact that there's more and more people working on finance, more and more transparency, and more and more research. So finally, we're starting to get some very interesting research that certain organizations are using for shareholder meetings, for voting at AGMs. They're using a variety of instruments to influence the behavior of the investors. And that means that there's a good opening to change some of the practices on the ground. So what have we noticed? So what investors are after, and we, we did actually a very big consultation as part of our project with the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, so UNPRI, Refinitiv, White and Case, it was a huge consortium. And we did around 200 global consultations with financial sector participants. Um, and it's very interesting. So everybody wants to invest. If you can tell a good story and a really inspirational story, they'll be interested. We have a really huge problem of boring conversations and boring stories. We do need to improve the narrative. How do you fit into the system? Why? Is this the best systematic solution? Because people want to see something that is innovative, that actually deploys systems thinking. And ideally, if you have tech involved, that's it. People are listening. We have a lot of uh, wealth generation and transfer. So that's also very interesting. In the next decade, we will see a lot of uh, generational wealth transfer. That in developed economies means that there's bigger and bigger pots of money, but also different owners of capital. So some people, uh, we've been talking to Ipsos Mori and others, surveys actually show that finally there might be a generation, quite a wealthy generation, that might be interested in other impact other than financial return. And that's a very big change because up until now, it's really not been um, the case. Also, people are really worried about the future trajectories. Um, most of the business models are still rooted in the risk um, return paradigm. And we're starting to see more and more research and more and more conversations bubbling up about impact. So, and this impact, of course, um, is super important because People are trying to understand how business models and investments and everything fits in with what we used to call 10 years ago megatrends, and it's becoming a very popular word. But climate and digitalization are the two biggest conversations. That's pretty much where, where money starts listening. So using these two megatrends and showing how these are actually, how you're coping with them or how you're actually helping to tackle the big issues is very, very important. The one mega trend that people don't want to talk about, but I think that will happen over the next decade, and it's a big systemic risk issue, is inequality. And actually, DSO is working on, uh, on electricity and uh, prosumers and uh, maybe being able to show that social impact going forward also will be very important. And risk mitigation. So um, actually most of the non-financial reporting is still embedded in risk, in spotting risk, in mitigating risk. Um, some people call it de-risking. Well, guess what? You can't de-risk. Uh, it's usually just mitigate risk or try to um, figure out how you're going to cope with it and spot it early. And for that, um, investors and in finance want more data. So they have understood that they cannot actually price risk correctly because what used to be not material, so for example, your carbon emissions or, um, I don't know, health policies for COVID, for example, then can actually have a very real financial impact. So if you have carbon tax and carbon pricing is coming and will come, um, there's going to be major initiatives launched in the next years that will focus on carbon pricing and alignment of reporting globally. So that means that finally there will be not apples and oranges, but maybe apples oranges and tangerines or something slightly more comparable. So that means that investors will be looking at um, pretty much projects and businesses that can show 
how they fit in with cutting emissions or improving efficiency and also social impact. So what kind of indicators you're hitting with your, um, with your social performance. And for that, actually, the indicators currently are very bad. Let's be honest. Uh, it, there's big data gaps and so on and so forth. But anyone who can demonstrate that they are doing reporting better than others will stand out. Investors love it when people show that actually they have a very serious approach to, um, to their reporting. Because currently, most of sustainability reports and even annual reports are not necessarily extremely well thought out. They're usually done very nicely by one of the big four, but actually in terms of reporting and data, they aren't always up to scratch. This is also starting to worry supervisors. So we're starting to see credit rating agencies working on it um, in the background, trying to figure out how they're gonna fit in into the equation. And also of course, supervisors um, in central banks and so on and so forth. So um, what are the kind of tangible next steps? Um, we always say that people are very passive most of the time. So they want shortcuts, they want easy things. Well, guess what? To influence and to make sure that um, you get your voice heard and that you um, are seen as potentially um, a good investment opportunity, actually the most successful ones that we've seen, even in the energy industry, have been the ones that are most active. And that means don't just go to the usual suspects where everybody else gets your advice. Look, look around, be proactive, try and appear, try and listen in and try to understand where are the more interesting conversations happening. And just being very proactive in terms of meetings, in terms of talking to different stakeholders immediately sets you apart. Um, this engagement across different silos is extremely important. And this is what uh, we usually call the more systemic approach to thinking and creating projects and trying to figure out um, new financing is if you can show that you have a partnership or any kind of a strong relationship with certain municipalities or businesses or even civil society now apparently is trendy. If you can show that you're thinking a little bit outside the box a bit differently, that immediately catches people's eye because usually you as an investor, according to most of uh, the people we've worked with, you just hear more of the same. And guess what? They get bored too. So they're looking for that very interesting cherry on the cake. That's at least a little bit uh, different, which of course is very difficult because we all face daily challenges that we need to, we have jobs to do, but, um, but organizations that have a little bit of that flexibility at the edges really stand to benefit because it's a time of change. And during times of change, um, there is a bit more openness. Um, anyway, that will be all from me. I'm happy to, of course, answer a lot of questions if there's any. Um, but that was a very quick overview in terms of what are the main pressures that um, finance is facing. And one of the big conversations, of course, will be the European single access point and reporting and data. And that's why the, I really wanted to deliver the message that reporting and data generation is extremely, extremely important. That is definitely a critical message. Um, appreciate that, that perspective, Linda. I think it's right on target. I think in the interest of time, we, we may come back and, and see what questions there are, but why don't we go ahead and, and go to the uh, perspective from Tora Jamaz from uh, the Copenhagen School of Energy Infrastructure and just uh, reflections on what you've heard in, session, in, in the, the first two sessions there, kind of the investment requirements and the regulatory framework to and, and financial enablers to enable that investment. I think it'd be uh, a good time for that. Um, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Very good. That's excellent. Uh, well, we, we, we coordinated, we met and coordinated the, the, the three of us um, to, to prepare the, a couple of slides for you. And uh, that's kind of what comes out of it when you put an um, in, industrialist and a banker and an ac academic together to, to, to talk about regulation and, and the investments in, 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 in DSOs. Um, so um, I'm, I'm improvising because I'm stepping in last minute um, in, in for, for, my, for my colleague. 
And uh, I, I hope uh, Paolo will also intervene and, and correct me. But uh, we, uh, we are in, in a complete agreement about the importance of uh, the, in the investments uh, in, in, in the net, in the DSOs. And also with the, with, with the Green Deal, uh, so the importance of this has, has increased. Uh, I, I have been researching sort of this sector for over 20 years or so when none of these was um, in, in, um, in, in, the, in the horizon and regulation was a little bit boring, especially in, in terms of the DSOs. And, uh, but, uh, but unfortunately, we, I, I thought we would have made probably more progress by, by now in terms of how to regulate and how to incentivize investments. Instead of sort of going forward, I, I've been able to go back and uh, I have even looked at the sort of 1850s uh, about the incentive regulation of cow gas in, in around Europe, in Sheffield and places like that and so on. But it, it is, a, it is we, we are talking about some of the most difficult uh, parts of uh, sort of regulatory economics. And, and that's why we have made very, very sort of, sort of little um, um, progress. Uh, how, however, um, having said that, uh, the, the role of re uh, regulation remains important, and we just have to try. We need to improve our um, our, our models. Uh, we have ex some regulators have experimented with output-based uh, sort of regulation. Experience has been mixed, but we haven't tried hard enough and long and, and, and long enough. So, uh, but um, there is also reason to look for other kind of um, models in terms of instead of the uh, move uh, from output based to service based and and reward uh, companies for uh, in terms of the value they create uh, for the customers. If it's sort of a value based approach rather than uh, how much sort of investment goes in. And then, based on some measures of uh, sort of uh, willingness to pay uh, for, for those services uh, uh, from them, uh, much can be said, um, uh, and most of you know uh, most of, uh, so about it. But there are some new things also happening, and and we we spent a fair amount of time uh, talking about green bonds as a, as as one of the sort of new new, new instruments. We have also researched it in our group uh, as well in Copenhagen. Uh, we, we have discovered that these uh, instruments, apart from being used in DNOs and DSOs and TSOs and, and, and so on, they have other kind of uh, properties. During the COVID, we, we, we managed to show that they were not very highly sort of correlated, for example, with other kind of assets like oil and, and gold. And, uh, and, and and other financial assets and so on. So they could be they could have some value in itself apart from what they are being used to. It's a, it's a useful in, in sort of a, in, in instrument for those who like to divert, to in, to um, in, to spread their risk and and and, and widen their, their portfolios and so on. So we need to sort of look a little bit maybe outside and identify a, a possible co benefits in, when uh, when faced with these uh, sort of new and innovative uh, sort of instruments. Um, there, we, we need to look at these things more. Uh, we, we, um, it's part of our, uh, our, our research agenda. Uh, but then uh, we also spent some time talking about the EU, EU taxonomy, a very good and timely um, effort and in, in initiative is much needed uh, because in times like this, uh, there are lots of uh, ideas and projects and companies and, and technologies showing up saying, um, well, we, I'm, I'm carbon free as well, I'm green. Uh, like everybody else, and, and so on, and uh, and this needs to be sort of uh, sorted out and clarified as, as quick as possible before some damage is actually sort of uh, done here. And then you can also go beyond the re regulators a, a little bit in terms of, I and mean, we saw in terms of how much we, we heard about 400 billion investment, or sometimes we hear one trillion investment, and and so on. And so a, a back of the envelope calculation can tell you probably 10, 20 euros per inhabitant in the EU. Uh, sort of will be spent uh, sort of in the in the DNOs and, and, and so on. It's, it's not probably very much money or so, but uh, there are other ways of thinking about uh, how much we'd like to, how much we should spend. Uh, one of them is uh, to, to, to look at, well, what happens to our economies if we have blackouts and, and our networks are not suitable for the purpose and so on? What is the economic cost of that? Uh, there is another way of, uh, of, of, of doing it, and, and, and that is uh, sort of to, to, to ask, um, what is it that uh, people are really uh, willing to pay? I and mean, we saw during the recent energy crisis, uh, uh, for example, that several governments uh, almost sort of panicked. They were looking for ways of supporting low income and vulnerable uh, uh, customers also. So it is just maybe possible that we began to see some prospects of the, the maximum uh, price that uh, many customers can, can tolerate. 
and uh, some government has started looking at the VAT and taxation of the energy and so on. Uh, so there might be some spillovers from this, from the, that goes to, uh, outside of the sector, be from the energy sector to the government general budget and how uh, VAT and other taxation uh, uh, sort of works in, a, in, in, in our economies. Uh, so we need to be prepared for some of that debate as well. I think I stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that's a great summary of uh, some of the issues associated with uh, financing and, and regulatory structures. And it's been a good discussion. I'm gonna turn it over to, to Philip to, to just jump on kind of the DSO response yeah. to, to these issues and what business models need to look like. And, and uh, that I think that discussion is critical before we wrap up here today. Yeah, I mean, we've been looking at a lot of, of course, a lot of the, the whole issue of this massive investment that is needed, this massive development and all the options that we have. And we did, within all of that, then the question is, so what does all this mean for the role of the DSO, the DSO business model? And and uh, the um, I guess that the, the innovations required to ensure an optimal outcome for customers and customer engagement. And, and within that, really trying, first of all, to understand uh, what are the parameters of the DSO? What role should the DSO play as a whole? So I'll, uh, I'm going to start then with uh, Alberto Patochny. Um, and uh, welcome. And, and then after that, we'll also have uh, Leo, um, Leonardo Mills, and um, to sort of um, agree or disagree or challenge on that. Uh, we already had one presentation, of course, uh, from Guido Patoni, who was going to speak uh, uh, after these two speakers, but uh, spoke a little bit earlier. But if um, if I introduce then Alberto, welcome. Yes, hi. Um, yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Just double check. We can, we can. Yeah, excellent. Good. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, in the interest of time, I will try to be brief, um, also a bit provocative, uh, because um, uh, we've, we've been working at the Florence School of Regulation on uh, future role for the DSOs, and maybe um, you know we, we contrast it with uh, with with the current role and with the current setting of uh, of uh, of the of the sector, especially the interlink uh, between uh, the TSOs and the DSO. So I have a presentation. I don't know whether I can use I can I can upload from my end or I'll try to upload it from my end. Let's see if go. I manage. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll try. Can you see it? Not. Oh, yes, we can. Good. Yep. OK, excellent. excellent. OK, so um, basically, I start with the obvious, uh, the fact that with uh, an increasing share of distributed energy resources and uh, especially of uh, variable uh, renewable resources, uh, the role of the DSOs would have to change. And it would be more and more a role of um, a system operator more than it has been in the past. And I think most of what has been discussed today already hint in that direction. And as such, they would, one of their role, main role would be the facilitate, to facilitate the participation of new players, new entrants, uh, smaller players, um, decentralized players in, in the markets, uh, in the uh, balancing market, in the services market, in the energy market. So this is one of the new roles. Um, until now, as uh, I think also Clara and Guido already pointed out and others, you know, the role was very much of a network operator. Now we're talking about the system operator. So we have a new role and uh, to, take, to accommodate new resources. And, um, and here comes a bit of the challenge. And um, here we see um, developments in two ways. And as I said, this is a bit of a provocation, um, but um, there is an issue of whether um, you know, the, uh, the balancing market, because this is what we are talking about, you know, the flexibility, we talk about flexibility markets, flexibility market as exists as such. So it will be probably be um, a balancing market. And there are calls for the balancing market to become uh, more decentralized and allow uh, the participation of uh, decentralized resources down to the energy communities um, to individual buildings, maybe group of buildings, uh, energy managers, et cetera. So now we have um, the, current, uh, the current setup where basically the balancing market does not go that far. Um, there is a um, EU, uh, is a system-wide, sorry, uh, balancing market, which is actually run typically by the TSOs. 
while the DSOs um, look, at, uh, look at local um, uh, sort of grid constraints and uh, um, local uh, support of possibly energy market at local level. And now we, we know with the, with, the, with, the, with the greater penetration of um, flexible resources at local level, um, then the question is, should we go uh, towards the uh, right and see an enhanced um, DSO model where the, um, the balancing market will split in to, at two levels, at, at a, a sort of system um, level, transmission level, and at distribution level, and then it will be managed by the TSO at, at a transmission level and by the DSO at the distribution level, and then obviously the um, the question is um, uh, how these two markets uh, will interlink and how um, the DSO level market, balancing market will also interlink with neighboring DSO uh, balancing market, or should we integrate um, the uh, balancing market, including at local level um, you know, under the TSO? Obviously that would have uh, um, issues. We believe that this is quite a complex setup and uh, it has challenges which are probably beyond what are the current capability in terms of organizational institution, but also just computation. Um, so obviously the, 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 uh, the, the, the enhanced DSO model is probably the uh, most practical one, but clearly it requires um, a new role for the DSO, new capabilities. And obviously we have to think that DSOs in Europe, they're not just the big ones, they're also smaller ones. And, uh, and then the issue is how these smaller DSOs will be able to cope with this, probably need some sort of governance or rearrangement of the DSO role. And also you need to um, strengthen the uh, interlinkages between the DSO level and the TSO level, because you don't want to create two separate markets. You want to make sure that um, the uh, resources available at DSO level would also, uh, could also feed into uh, the, the TSO balancing market. Now, there are already some uh, um, issues, uh, barriers to um, the entry uh, into the market of small players. I think ASA in their um, latest market monitor report spent a lot of time and effort and presented very interesting results uh, in terms of the barriers, uh, not only for the um, appropriate pricing of uh, in the different market, but also barriers to entry of smaller players. So we have, to, we have to look into that direction and also have this new DSO role. Um, just, to, um, just to conclude, we have developed an, an, an assessment framework where we look at different dimension on how to uh, analyze the two possible alternatives when we look at the connection between um, the, uh, the balancing and the network, the balancing and the wholesale market. And uh, also uh, we look at um, the, um, another dimension of, for the assessment. Um, of, of, the different, uh, of the different models. So uh, including the possibility or the easiness with which uh, new uh, players would be able to enter. Anyway, that, that was just a bit of a provocation also to uh, have, I hope that DSOs reacting and stand up to the challenge. I'm sure they're very ready, but not just the big ones, all of them. And uh, my last slide is just watch this space because as I mentioned, we've been working on it and possibly by the, the end of the year or early in the new year, we will issue a report exactly on how we could uh, enhance um, the involvement of distributed resources in the future, future organization of the flexibility markets, uh, which will see a major role uh, for the DSO. So that's all I wanted to say. As I said, a bit of introduction, um, short one, uh, but just to set the scene and a bit provocative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Albert. A really good overview and, and good to be provocative. And, uh, and probably linking well to that, we'll now uh, move over to Leonardo and, um, and hear your view on this. Yeah, thanks, Philip. Um, uh, maybe you're expecting that I will also be provocative. I do not know if I can uh, match Alberto's, uh, but um, I, don't, I didn't prepare slides because I was just listening to all the comments and I have a few reactions to what I've heard uh, so far. And it's always a pleasure to be with all of you here uh, in these EDSO events. 
Um, so I, I thought to start from what Johan said. So I, I thought Johan made a, you know, an appealing call to be more proactive when it comes to distribution grid investments, right? Because he said mm -hmm. the, the risk of underinvesting is bigger than the risk of overinvesting or the cost. Um, and even though that I think in theory that sounds very appealing, I, I, I am afraid that the reality of the practice will be that, you know, we might, in, even if we don't want to, end up in situations where we have underinvested. And why do I think that? Well, first, I think Clara already explained how difficult it is for regulators to regulate this new situation we are in. And as a result, I think we might, you know, in many cases um, have um, some underinvestments. Also, I think if you look at the TSOs, I think some 10 years ago when TSOs were expecting, um, you know, an, an acceleration of offshore wind or other big renewable projects, I think at some point they also made this claim, like, like let's try to be more proactive. And I think the experience with TSOs has also been that this is very hard to achieve, right, in grid investments. Um, so what does that mean? Well, I think the reality we've already seen in some countries like the Netherlands, UK and the Netherlands, where you have congestion in distribution grids is unfortunately going to be a situation we will see more spreading around Europe. I think that many other countries can still not imagine they will ever have congestion in the distribution grid. I'm, uh, I'm one of, you know, based in one of those countries in Belgium, if you talk to stakeholders they, and they see a picture of what's going on in the Netherlands, they can hardly believe that will ever happen in Belgium, but I think it will if we really start to accelerate everything. And then the question is, how are we going to limit the costs, you know, the consequences of having uh, moments where we will have undersized distribution grids? Um, and then I think it comes back to uh, this session on the DSO role and consumer engagement. Um, and there, uh, if you've seen the paper by CER from September this year on exactly that topic of um, consumer engagement and consumer protection. They actually say as regulators that they are embracing the reality that we will continue to have different type of consumers. So we will have some of these really engaged consumers that really wanna engage with DSOs, with retailers, with all kinds of service providers, and they will make, you know, they will manage their own portfolio. Some of them will really be like that, but you will also have consumers that are engaged, but want simplicity. So they will just outsource everything to one provider. And then I think it's up to DSOs to connect with these kind of providers like aggregators. Um, but then we still have the issue of the non-engaged consumer that will probably still be a significant size of the population. And non-engaged can be because they're vulnerable, they don't have the money to engage or invest or not have the time, or the other extreme, uh, they couldn't be bothered, right? They have, they have more, too much money to care about this uh, uh, stimulus that we might give them. And then I think the question is, because uh, how will we handle these non-engaged consumers? Uh, will we continue to just let them do whatever they want? Or will we redefine the property rights of everyone connected to distribution grid? So are we willing to, for instance, uh, have some of these connections to be mandatory um, uh, non-firm, right? That's a conversation I think that we've not yet had because the clean energy package is very much focused on this voluntary type of flexibility, uh, market-based, and of course we like that, but what if we don't get there? with these kind of schemes? Will we enter into more mandatory schemes? Uh, one country has done it, Germany has this, right? This idea that you can connect, uh, curtail all connections up to 3%. Clean energy package foresees that all countries could do this if they present a cost benefit analysis that is positive. Um, so that's a big question for me. Um, uh, will we do that? And will we do it in time? Because if we wait until we have the congestion and all, until we have all these uh, problems, I think it will indeed be very politically sensitive and a big issue. So uh, maybe not. let's not only try to be proactive on the investments, let's also accept that that will not always be the case. And let's try to be proactive on how we are going to handle these situations of congestion. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Very good, uh, and and good to be a bit provocative too in that sense. Too. 
And, and coming from the perspective of uh, consumer psychology, which is my background originally, um, I can, I can, I think that this issue of active consumers is always very limited. Of course, there are only going to be so many. But as you see with electric vehicles, one thing I would say is that it doesn't matter how you get customers to be active, uh, whether it's through um, being environmentally conscious or just wanting a car that accelerates fast. The main thing is that you get them to behave in the way you want them to. But, um, but so great. That I have one question actually for Alberto. Um, already for um, a question is um, it's from uh, Rodolfo Martinez from Iberdrola um, and it says um, don't you think that a super TSO model will destroy plenty of economies of scope that already exist in the DSO model? Um, uh, in, indeed well I mean uh, both of them are quite challenging um, I, can't, I don't want to pre and uh, the, uh, the report we will issue but I can say that our assessment is going to um, is, is is going to favor, if you want, or, or, or indicate that the enhanced DSO model is probably the most appropriate, um, even though it has challenging challenges in itself. Uh, so indeed, the, both of them are challenging. Uh, both of them will require adaptations and and, and new and new um, new relationships. Uh, but indeed. It seems that uh, the enhanced DSO is, um, is, is probably the most appropriate. It's up to the, T to the DSOs to make it happen. Really good. Okay, so I think we're, given the time, I think if we then um, uh, wrap up, Mark, uh, we can give some concluding comments. If you go first, Mark. I think, do we want to get the perspective from Xavier? Um, on on this session three, that I oh, sorry, uh, yes, Xavier yes. Hansen just and, and he can try to make it short, and then we'll we'll wrap up. I indeed, think be indeed. Right sorry. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, I'll try to be quick. Uh, so uh, Tommy Medved and myself and and others had a short discussion about this topic. Be actually ahead of this of this um, conference, but I think it links quite well into into what has been said. Um, we we had quite diverging views also on the on the capabilities and, and role of of uh, DSOs, with some being more uh, optimistic and others a bit a bit less. But I think it. Um, it fits it well into, the, into this discussion. What we could agree on is that the DSS will, will continue to act as neutral market facilitators and, and should also in future not uh, enter competitive markets. However, um, DSOs <clears throat> understand and, and will have to uh, innovate their business models to engage with these new technologies that have been discussed today, like electric vehicles, um, uh, self-consumption and, and energy communities and, and the like. Um, but what we what we actually insisted on quite a lot in our discussion is that um, it's a point that, that Alberto also mentioned, which is the, the diversity that we see in terms of size and resources of DSOs. And a question that we that we raised and that we, we couldn't really finally answer is whether DSOs will actually, uh, all, all of the 2,400 DSOs in Europe will actually have the capabilities to, to be the, the spark of innovation that we, that we are looking for, or whether maybe um, some sort of new service providers, as we have seen also in the, in the world ceremony, might, might come in and actually create the link between customers and DSOs, uh, will go to customers and, and try to, to, to get their flexibility and, and their, um, <clears throat> their services that they can, that they can deliver to, to, to solve the problems that we've been discussing today. Um, so this is for us a bit of, a, of an open question, and, and I think given the diversity of, of the DSO landscape in, in Europe, the answer might be different in, in different places. And uh, I really think the award ceremony today was a very good, uh, was very uh, was, was showing this very very nicely as we saw some some external uh, providers and some some DSOs. If we could go to the next slide, um, what we also saw is that uh, regardless of if this this. Uh, <laughs> new customer interaction will be will be done by DSOs directly or uh, through through third parties. Uh, DSOs will have to overcome the passive relationship they currently have with with customers mostly, and there is a, a great value in this, of course, as, as has been discussed at length today, 
um, to, as, as a complement to, to the conventional grid reinforcements. Uh, we then also went into, into something that, that was more the, the second session today about uh, the, the role of regulation in all this. I think Clara showed very well that, that regulators today understand the, the challenges of this, but that these challenges are very complex. I myself was a regulator until a year ago, and I, I, I know how, how hard this is, but this, uh, so this problem has to, be, has to be cracked basically to, to come beyond the, the current connect and reinforce model and to uh, really enable uh, flexibility uh, services and, and, and the such. And last topic that we touched on that uh, maybe wasn't discussed as much today is the, the role of data and how DSOs sit on a lot of very important data that can enable uh, new business models and, and new, new services that can help uh, the grid of tomorrow. And uh, I think that's also a very important aspect that, uh, that should be looked into a bit, a bit more. And that's, that's it from my side. <clears throat> so thank you very much. Uh, please, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, did you want uh, Philip and I to take just uh, two minutes to, to wrap up our conclusions or do you want to take over, Roberto? Okay, carry on. No, okay, no, you, you carry on, sorry. Just in terms of, uh, you know, the, the investment requirements and enabling those investments, I think a uh, very important conclusion from the Deloitte study and the discussions is that a significant portion of investments that DSOs need to make are investments that will enable societal goals and, and economic progress and sustainability and decarbonization and that those investments are investments that are difficult to um, under our existing regu regulatory structure. They don't fit our traditional investments, which is um, make sure that we provide reliable electricity um, and meet the demands. But we, we're being asked to do more than that. And a lot of the investments that we need to, to make are, are those additional responsibilities that the DSO will need to take on. And I think we heard about that in terms of the regulatory challenges and risk assessments from a financial point of view. And I think it's a uh, great opportunities for innovation and discussion on this council. So great discussion in, uh, in those sessions this, today. And I would just say very last thing, I totally agree, Mark. And, and just to say that I think so many interesting ideas and so many sort of uh, contradictions in a sense uh, that we face in this market, the need to plan uh, to invest. We need to plan to invest. We need to plan long-term to invest. And yet in many ways, we, we can't see the future but we need to plan. We need to oversize in many ways, as, as was mentioned, uh, because the consequences of getting it wrong are, are, are disastrous, but there's a massive challenge to, to get um, that done as well, as, as we heard, um, who wants to pay for more than they need. Um, and uh, there's also a need to, um, uh, to give opportunities to all players, but at the same time, to ensure that um, there's enough value in it for the players that are actually in the market at the same time. Uh, so to not broaden the net to the point where, where no one gets enough for what they need. And I think lastly, then, just to say that um, uh, a need to really broaden the, the role of the DSO um, to enable all of this uh, to happen. And at the same time, to ensure that all those other players' opportunities are not reduced through that, but also to make sure that all the players collaborate together in order to achieve this common goal. So I think... Um, a really, really exciting discussion. Thank you very much to all the great speakers and, and also the great questions that were posed by the audience. Yes, so I'll, I'll take over now. Uh, thank Mark McGranagan. Thank you, Philip Lewis, for the moderation of uh, this extremely interesting discussion, very much in the scope of uh, the Stakeholder and Innovation Council. I hope uh, to have you also next year with us. And uh, uh, these are said a great thank you to all the speakers today. Uh, you have been uh, bringing a value to this initiative. And uh, uh, we decided uh, in, on the spot uh, that uh, we shall uh, emphasize uh, your intervention and uh, edit the recording uh, in the next days um, in order to uh, give a value to this uh, discussion separately from the rest of the proceedings of uh, the Stakeholder and Innovation Council that uh, will also be uh, highlighted in the complete uh, recording available as of uh, uh, tomorrow on our website. 
uh, along with all the presentations. Now I would like to give the floor to Mark van Stippel, Deputy Head of Unit uh, <clears throat> for Innovation, Research, Digitalization, and Competitiveness at DG Energy. Mark is a friend of EDSO, uh, is uh, our uh, reference point for the uh, demo projects that we participate into, and as always uh, uh, had uh, a clear vision of the DSO activity and the progress of the DSO technologies and applications and what is the framework that is there for the future. And uh, uh, this is why we asked him um, a, a challenging title for his uh, final intervention, which is harnessing the evolution between customers, consumers attitude and energy transition. So please, Mark, join us on the screen. You have the last word almost on time and thank you for your patience, please. Thank you, Roberto. And um, thank you everybody at EDSO for inviting me to this uh, Stakeholder and Innovation Council. And uh, it is uh, difficult to see what I can still add uh, after uh, you know, so many distinguished speakers and panelists that you've had today. Um, but I think that's why you indeed gave me uh, this difficult topic to address. So uh, indeed, that is quite a challenge and something that, uh, of course, we've been kind of breaking our head over uh, already over quite some time. Um, so maybe a, a few points that I would like to mention uh, here and a few things that I would like to address. First of all, of course, on the, on the role of the grids, then on uh, how to get consumers on board, both on the side of, uh, let's say, innovation um, and, and new solutions, but also from the point of view of uh, the, the basic uh, rules and, and the, let's say, the, the, the legal framework that we have. So um, I will try to take a few minutes, or just to, I will try just to take a few minutes of your time because I realize I'm the last speaker of the day. And as I said, you've already had so much um, expertise dropped on you that uh, I think you must be quite saturated by now. Um, and if you allow me to repeat a few things that I think are uh, quite obvious, but just in the light of what we're talking about today, I would still like to mention them um, because I think that uh, we may not mention enough um, when we talk about Fit for 55 um, and the objective uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030 or to be climate neutral by 2050 at the latest, how essential the grid is uh, because of uh, the decarbonization that we need that takes place to a large part and that also has been most uh, successful in electricity if you compare it let's say with transport in general or buildings in general so a drive towards electrification a drive, a drive towards decentralization um, makes the role of the grids more and more important the electricity system more important and the role of the dso is more and more important and uh, the investment needs are huge and I think, you know, we have quite a few models and we are not the only ones who make these models that all underline the huge investments that are needed uh, in the grids, both in hardware, in copper, but also in uh, software and in the, so to say, facilitating uh, environment. And I think that here also uh, what we may not mention enough is, is the role of the, the system operators, both transmission and distribution as um, I mean, I think you very often say market facilitators. I would even call it uh, kind of the basic foundation for a lot of innovation to happen. Uh, the, um, uh, the, just a very simple example, if um, a network operator is not, um, let's say, interested in incentivizing uh, or giving signals to the market to see if they can help solving congestion, then that service of households contributing to uh, solving congestion through smart charging or demand response will not happen. And there is really a key role for the network operators and in particular for the DSOs 
to uh, to make uh, these type of innovations happen. So they're really, uh, yeah, as I said, they're kind of almost the, the basic layer, the facilitator, but really a driver for these type of things to happen. And I can um, understand that, of course, the discussion of what this role means and how far to go and, and what to do and what not to do is uh, not, a, not an easy question. And I think it's good that you have discussions like today to really sort out what, what the key issues are and what the key parameters are, so to say. And I think that this is uh, also what we're trying to support with Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe is to test what can this new role of uh, DSOs and TSOs be? How can they fulfill this role of, of market facilitation? And I think this is also then a clear link to uh, the topic that uh, you've asked me to talk about today, namely how do we get, uh, how do we you know, harness the, the, the balance between consumer attitude and the energy transition? I would say, you know, how do we get consumers on board? Or how do we keep them on board? Um, and I think, um, you know, you were talking about uh, active consumers before. Um, I think sometimes, uh, I don't think this was the case just now, eh? but I, the, let's say if we want every consumer to be active, then of course, we're going to have a bit of a problem. I mean, in a way, we want consumers to be kind of lazy and relaxed and have confidence that when they worry 15 minutes per year about uh, the best offer for the energy service, then they're fine. And that they can trust that whatever they've decided uh, basically keeps them warm and delivers them the cheapest energy for, for some time to go. Because if, we, if they have to worry about their energy supply every year, or every, sorry, not every year, but every day or every week, then uh, I'm not necessarily sure if we're doing them a favor because this can very easily turn against you. Um, I think we, it has, of course, we have to start with informing consumers and um, creating some kind of literacy, but it should not go into making them worried about everything that they do. And uh, the key word, uh, I think, from our point of view here is uh, how can we empower them? And I think here we have uh, made a few steps with the clean energy package, in particular, when we talk about the right to self consume and uh, the local energy communities and the renewable energy communities. Uh, where they have the right to generate, store, and sell electricity, and they should not be hampered by disproportionate procedures and um, be fairly remunerated for the electricity that they generate. Of course, these are nice principles, but the way we actually implement them is kind of important. And this is also something where this is not an easy task for member states or, again, for regulators or network operators. So we are, uh, from a commission point of view, trying to support that as much as we can on the one hand with studies and support to member states and guidance. And on the other hand, also setting up a kind of inventory or uh, observatory where we can map and provide technical support to uh, these energy communities. And um, we think that this as is kind of a, in a way the way I would see it is this is kind of the forefront of what innovation in the energy market in terms of new services to consumers that help them uh, to be carbon neutral, that help them to basically embrace the energy transition and see benefits from it for themselves, that then also should make it easier to accept investments. If they're able to uh, co-invest in windmills, of course, the, uh, the acceptance is much higher than when they are planted in their backyard uh, because of a uh, you know, let's say a big decision. And I think we see a lot of good initiatives happening in this area where there's more and more insight into how you can get them on board. But the key in all these things is basically empower them, give them an effective choice, which doesn't mean that they need to worry about it, let's say every day, but where they can, um, where it also brings a concrete benefit for them to try and understand what's happening, then make an investment decision or an engagement decision or a decision to switch and, and have confidence that, that, uh, that they, with that, they are well served. And I think this, this goes into many directions. And so the energy community is the right to self-consume, but also new innovative services, things like smart charging, demand response. These kind of things are all, um, for me, they're not necessarily an active consumer. They can still be a lazy consumer. We should make all these things very, very easy. Um, and I think that is... Uh, that is, really, that is really the key where we should go. And it, it, it requires, um, let's say, if we want to make it easier, of course, the system behind it is not easy. And that can be a very complicated system in terms of how you mentioned the data exchange that needs to be behind it, the rules that need to be set up for such energy communities to function 
properly so that they don't, uh, so to say, create a problem in the grid and um, bank on somebody else's payments in order for that community to thrive. And so th these are not easy rules. And I think what we see that in many, many places in Europe, people are searching what these rules should be. But we think that uh, these are the things to do and the way to go. And I think we can also see the, the good examples of it. And I think one of the tasks that we, that we have is to make sure that these examples are spread as best as we can. And then last but not least, I think one, no, actually two more things. One is, of course, this is not independent from the way we tariff and we make people pay for energy. And they may pay, think that the um, commodity price uh, is an issue and that, uh, let's say, the grid pays for itself. But, so this, I think, comes back again to not just um, empowering them, but with the empowerment also comes an interest and becomes a kind of literacy of how the energy market works that also makes them understand that, uh, let's say, some of the parts of the way in which electricity is priced and that the fact that, you know, putting everything on the grid and putting everything through uh, regulated tariffs is not necessarily the solution to go. Um, but of course, here we are talking very about very literate consumers if we go into this kind of discussion. Um, but I think what, what the, yeah, I think the basic point is still the same. Having the having the ability to choose, having the feeling that you are actually empowered to do things that you would like to do, will give you a lot of trust and an interest into things that say further down the line that are maybe not of direct concern, but that give you more confidence in the system you are participating in. And um, I think here one uh, last thing: we are at the moment working on a digitalization of energy action plan that's supposed to come out due next year that's timing still to be confirmed but we are also there looking at specific digital tools that we can use to make these things easier uh, like peer-to-peer -peer trading um, type of blockchain solutions etc they can really help in making it easy for consumers to get engaged um, i think we also need to look at what are then the rights and how can consumers effectively exercise their rights when it becomes a more digital data-driven energy services market so to say so that's not something to go lightly over but uh, the the digital tools can really help to make all these things easy and to basically harmonize uh, the kind of contradiction between on the one hand being an active and an engaged consumer and on the other hand being very lazy because you don't need to worry about it all the time so i think that's a challenge we are not there yet that's clear but I can see a lot of good examples uh, coming up and a lot of, uh, you know, advancement in also the way the questions are being asked to see how we can progress. So I think we, uh, we are on a good track. Mark, thank you very much. As always, uh, 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 you used an anticipation to set uh, the DSO's agenda for the next uh, six months. And uh, we are very grateful for, <laughs> for this anticipation that you uh, that you were already anticipating earlier this morning uh, at another panel I was uh, taking part in, and uh, uh, that uh, had the trigger there a lot of questions uh, on uh, on the real intentions of the Commission about this, and uh, I took the liberty to tell everybody that, uh, in my opinion, it was going to be serious, and uh, it was going to be a lot of uh, a workload for everybody in that room. So <laughs> this is exactly what I'm going uh, to say here. I would ask everybody to come on the screen and uh, uh, just uh, to uh, see each other uh, all together in the faces. Uh, and uh, Paula also, Zeni and, uh, and the staff uh, of, uh, of EDSO, if possible, and uh, if they want it. And uh, guys, thank you very much for being there. Uh, really, it was a great, uh, uh, great stuff around here. Uh, I would like to thank you personally one by one. It is not possible, but uh, uh, really you made an effort. I acknowledge that we made an effort and you should acknowledge that as well. Bravo everybody and hope to see you next year also for the fifth edition of the Stakeholder and Innovation Council. We shall circulate the, the, the main uh, outcome and uh, uh, of this one. And uh, have a good evening. And thank you very much for being there. It has been, as always, a pleasure to have you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Everything fine. Yeah. Thank bye. you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Very successful event.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.